I watch the news compulsively. Sometimes it is dull, irrelevant, filled with stories which do not really seem to matter, but sometimes it brings me face to face with realities I could not otherwise imagine. Some say that watching the news can be bad for you, that it has a depressing effect on your mental health, that it negatively colors your view of the world, and that may well be true. But there are times, there are stories which show the world as it is, uncolored, a world which I think we need to see, no matter how distressing the stories are. I'm thinking of stories like these, stories of people and homes washed away by floods in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Texas, stories of people and homes destroyed by hurricanes in the Caribbean, stories of villages in Switzerland or China engulfed by landslides, stories of cities and their inhabitants in Syria or Iraq or Yemen destroyed by warfare, stories of the fragility and vulnerability of human life, of families shattered, of children left parentless, of parents rendered childless. All this needless suffering, all this wanton cruelty, all these innocent, helpless people, their stories must be told. Their stories need to be heard. As I read the words from Exodus 12, which are the focus of our service this morning and which Nan read for us a few minutes ago, I cannot help but wonder what it would be like if a splash of color by the door could spare these homes and these people from the calamity of floodwaters or wind or landslides or war. Would the world not be so much better a place, so much happier? There's something not quite right about this passage. It appears to be different things. The thing it purports to be cannot be the thing that it is. What it purports to be is this, a crisis point for the Hebrew people in Egypt and indeed for the Egyptians themselves has been reached. Things have been getting steadily worse. Plague has been heaped upon plague. Oppression and cruelty have multiplied and the decisive moment has come. For the Hebrews it is almost time to go. So God gives instructions, but the instructions are not about what to take or what to leave behind. They're not about what direction to take or how to evade detection. They're about a final meal. The people are told, roast a whole lamb. Dress yourselves for the journey and then eat it. Eat it with bitter herbs and unleavened bread, every last scrap of it. Do not even leave one single thing, but burn what you cannot eat. Gather together enough people to consume a whole lamb and use its blood to mark your home that it might be spared the last 
and most terrible calamity. As instructions for people about to leave home forever, how much sense does this make? Well, of course, it makes sense to eat well and not to leave behind valuable food. But a whole lamb, no matter how completely consumed, would not sustain a family for 40 years the 40 years that lay ahead. And we might ask, why the need to roast it? Why not boil it? Why is that forbidden? And why eat it with bitter herbs and not some other vegetable? And one more question. Did God not already know which were the houses of the Hebrews without the need to for them to mark the doorposts. A deity who knew the birth order of every living creature could certainly be expected to memorize some addresses. But these questions simply point to the truth that this passage is not what it maybe at first seems to be or claims to be. It isn't a historical record. Of course, it was written many years, perhaps hundreds of years later. And these are not instructions for a people about to leave. They're instructions for people commemorating, for people remembering an event in the lives of their ancestors. This is about ritual not practicality. It's about connecting with the past, not preparing for the immediate future. Except that's not entirely true. While it is not directly about preparing to leave home the very next day for 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, it is about preparing for the future through connecting with the past. This is a practice to counter the truth that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. The Jewish people, the descendants of those who escaped from Egypt, have always considered the Exodus to be the defining moment in their history. These liturgical instructions, these instructions for a form of commemorative worship, connect them with that event. As long as the ritual described in these verses is repeated. But because we also read these verses, we are faced with the question that we face so often. Are these verses important to us? And if so, why? It's easy to see why this story, the story of the Exodus, which begins with this passage, has become so important for so many different liberation movements and oppressed peoples around the world and throughout history. For example, the Boers in 19th century South Africa trekking across the Transvaal to escape from British colonial domination found that they understood their story through the lens of this story. On a different continent, African-American slaves sang when Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people go, oppressed so hard they could not stand, let my people go, singing their struggle for liberation in biblically inspired words. 
in every struggle for freedom, in every struggle against oppression, in every struggle for what is right, there is encouragement and hope to be found in the stories of other struggles. Struggles like this one sustained by nothing more than a promise, <clears throat> a promise to be spared the worst, a promise of deliverance, a promise of a better future. Those of us with no wish to be doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past, look to history to learn. And we see stories of the great struggles for justice and freedom, struggles of whole peoples and nations. But what we do not see are the myriad of individual struggles that comprise so much of life. Yet this is where for most of us, our lives are lived. Not in the struggles which make history, but in the struggles of ordinary life. The struggles to bring up children well. The struggles to care for the old with dignity. The struggles to secure a decent living the struggles to make relationships work or to break them when they don't, the struggles to be accepted when we are seen as different, the struggles to do the right even when that's neither easy nor popular. You see, each one of us, in some way or another, lives in our own personal Egypt. For each one of us, there is a place where we are, and there is a better place. For some, getting there may involve physical moving, as it did for the Hebrew people escaping Egypt a leaving of one place and establishing a new life in another, such as leaving a home which has become a place of abuse. But mostly, the journey that we must take is not so much physical, but mental and spiritual, making where we are better for ourselves and the people with whom we share our lives. For a very long time, the Church of Christ has identified itself with this story of Exodus, seeing the Hebrew people struggling for liberation, struggling for a better life, taking a journey from oppression towards deeper faithfulness as our direct ancestors in faith. And the church has seen their story as a template for our story. So Exodus becomes an image, a template, which is at least as relevant now as at any time in our past. Where we are as the people of God is not working. We communicate the gospel amongst ourselves, but we seem to be failing to communicate it convincingly beyond our own communities. The church seems to be losing out to secularism and commercialism. And often we seem to view our history not so much as something to learn from as we prepare for the future, but as something to cling to because we have idolized our past, 
and we are fearful for our future. But it is time to move on. It's always time to move on. It's time to reimagine our life as the church, to journey into deeper faithfulness, to enter the searching and the hardships of wilderness. And we need to prepare to go quickly because there's not much time left. It's daunting, but it is possible. And we see that in the story of Exodus, remembered in this liturgy of commemoration laid out in these verses that we've read this morning. It is possible because in each, because like each household on the night of the Passover, we too are a family. A family determined to believe in a better future, determined to believe that somehow we will make it through. We are a family called to transformational journey, not just for ourselves, but for all people. We are a family called not to run, not to escape, but to lead, to lead through love, compassion, kindness, care, to be a splash of color on the lintels of the world, to stand with the suffering and seek to transform lives laid waste, to transform them through sharing the love that we ourselves receive in such abundance through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.